Hey everyone, my name is Tyler and welcome back to the St. Saviors Virtual Youth Group. If you haven't already, click that subscribe button and hit the bell icon so that you get notifications every time we post a new video. Let's get started. Today's topic, mental health. This is the second video in a two-part series all about mental health. Today's video is all about management. How do we deal with isolation and depression during a pandemic? What are the resources in your school and community? And how do we cope with stress and anxiety in our day-to-day -day life? I've got four incredible guest speakers today who are gonna share their thoughts and opinions on mental health and the importance of putting your mental health first. Now, it's no surprise that there is a global pandemic happening right now. That's why I'm coming to you virtually. This pandemic and the lockdown measures that have been put in place have taken an extreme toll on the mental health of everyone around the world. People are experiencing higher rates of stress, anxiety, depression, and even suicide. Throughout this episode, we're gonna be talking about the pandemic and the effects that it's had on everyone's mental health, especially youth. Check out this quick video on ways that you can cope with stress and anxiety during a global pandemic. Many of us suffer with low moods, depression, or anxiety all the time. And so when there's something bigger that's adding to that, it can really make things worse. Keeping good connection with your providers is really important. Um, if you have a psychiatrist, um, seeing what their provisions are. There are lots of new and creative ways that people are receiving care. So don't think that seeing your therapist or your healthcare provider right now is out of the question because it's absolutely not. Now is not the time to, you know, to, um, to, to isolate, you know, or to distance from, from your, your treaters. Um, even your primary care provider, you know, being, being able to reach out and know that you have that resource available to answer medical. Um, concerns that you might have. It's really important to continue taking your medications. It can be um, somewhat scary to go out and if you're someone who is really social distancing and isolating, um, it may be scary to go to the pharmacist. But there are ways that you can get to the pharmacy to get your medications with low risk. The stress of, of what's going on can perhaps lead more people to feel hopeless and, and helpless and, and even entertain suicidal thoughts. It's really important to know that help's available. Um, there are suicide hotlines um, and there are direct resources available in the community. Please reach out, please take care of yourself and make sure you're doing the things that you need to do to stay healthy. I think it's so important to talk about mental health and have conversations. That's why I've made a real effort to talk to as many different people and get as many perspectives as possible. First off, we're gonna hear from a great friend of mine, Helena, in Kelowna. So why don't you first start by introducing yourself and letting us know what you do. Um, so my name's Helena. I work at Village at Mill Creek. Right now I'm the visitation coordinator, um, but that's just my new role because of COVID. Before I was more involved with like recreation and taking care of their well-being. Um, by making sure they're having fun. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. And we met uh, through Live Different, right, down in Mexico last yeah. fall. Yeah. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And yeah, thanks again for talking today. Yeah. So before the pandemic hit, I was on tour traveling across Canada with Live Different, actually speaking um, at element or sorry, middle and high schools to youth about um, owning your story and just basically like youth empowerment. Um, and just trying to let people know that the things that happen to you aren't what define you and you get to decide, um, how you want to live your life and yeah, that you're not the victim in your story. You can actually like choose every day to make better choices and yeah, you're not powerless. Things yeah. change. <laughs> Well, just from my own experiences, my dad and his family, they never talked about mental health and it caused like a lot of negative impact on his entire life. And now just like growing up with him now, I've been, you know, introduced through school and, and just talking about it more. And 
even talking to him now, it's like he's feeling way better and he could have been feeling this way the whole time. And so as a young person, it's so important to talk about it now and like end the stigma so that you can have the help the entire time you need it and not feel like you're a burden or that your life is like inconvenient for other people because mental health is so important for everyone. Yeah. Especially young people. (laughs) Yeah. So in the care homes right now, it's really rough. Um, We've only been allowed the last um, few months to have one designated visitor per resident. So um, they don't get to see like their family or their friends. So having that lack of connection is really detrimental to their mental health and their emotional well-being. Um, So the pandemic has been like very difficult for the seniors, but also for young people not going to school for all those months and like just having social media as like kind of your only form of connection is really difficult because it's really not um, realistic. Like you're having all these different views. People are posting all the best parts of their lives. And then it's like, that's what you see. And you think that everybody else is doing okay during the pandemic, but that's not reality. People are isolated and lonely. Yeah, and with social media, it's just a lot of false interactions, right? And I think this false reality, like you said, it's not realistic, uh, what's being put on on social media. And that's where everyone's been for the last eight months is on their devices. So, Well, I would highly recommend, like, booking, like, video chat tea time with your friends. Like, anything to stay connected and feel like you actually have a community still. Um, Obviously, face-to-face contact is not always the best option right now during these times, but even if you go out by yourself and go get some fresh air, go for a walk every day, that's so beneficial. You know, get some endorphins going when you're exercising and breathing in the fresh air. So I like to do yoga in my backyard. Um, And it like really helps just early in the morning when you're getting things going, just to have a nice fresh start to your day. Um, Recently, the last few months I've been journaling and it's really helpful to be able to like reflect on the way you're feeling and really check in with yourself every day. Um, Other things is like, I make a list of things that I like to do. And so then one day when I'm not feeling 100%, it's harder to like think about what you want to do when you're not feeling great. Um, So I've just picked something off that list and done it. And then I just usually end up having a way better day after. So Um, I would probably tell people to start a gratitude journal. I actually won one at work last year at Thanksgiving, or I guess that was two years ago now since we were in Mexico last year. But um, yeah, you get to like write every day something that you're grateful for. And then it really makes you start to look for like the better things in life and see the positives. Um, Also making sure that you're staying connected um, because it's really hard when you're isolated during these times, especially, but just checking in with your friends and maybe even having like a list of people that you try to check in with at least monthly. Yeah. 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 So a lot of the time when the residents are feeling like really lonely, I will just spend time with them. We'll usually like play a game of crib or we'll listen to some music put on something to like really take your mind off of it like even turning on their favorite movie on tv or their favorite show or just like spending some time with them and making them laugh that's like basically what we do I also chocolate is a good motivator so they're usually pretty happy if you bring them candy (laughs) there's no doubt that there's a lack of resources and support for indigenous youth in Canada when it comes to mental health The suicide rate among Indigenous youth in Canada is three times higher than the national rate. I connected with a friend of mine to get her opinion on mental health in our northern communities. We also discussed if residential schools have an impact on the mental health of future generations of Indigenous youth in Canada. 
Check it out. Hi, Brittany. Hi. Um, so as Tyler said, my name is Brittany Gillespie. Um, I work with Live Different, and I do um, office work from home. Um, I live in Manitoba, um, Winkler. And yeah, so I'm really happy to be a part of this call. That's awesome. And what is uh, your other role with Live Different that you've done in the past? Um, in the past, I have been an intern with Live Different. Um, so on tour on the roads, I've been a ro road team leader just this past year that we did that was cut short due to COVID. Um, and so what we did was we would travel Western Canada and we would go to um, indigenous communities up north. Um, and we would be there for two days and we would do our normal presentation along with two days of activities and a concert as well that was free for the for the community so any anybody was allowed to come and uh we, we did a quite a few sharing circles which got really really deep and so it was it was really amazing great experience yeah i think that's something that's really unique about um that specific road team is the extra programming and the sharing circles mm -hmm. and the time that you guys get to spend with the students outside of the presentation i think that's really meaningful yeah. Um, for me, it's very important um, because I've, I've experienced firsthand like what mental health can do if it's not taken care of. Um, I've, I've suffered with depression and like really, really bad when I, when I was a teenager. And so it, it's very important to take care of and make sure that you're on top of it and know that like it's, it's normal and everyone goes through it and that you're not, you're not alone. And it can be very harmful for yourself and others too. Yeah. And so as someone who's experienced it and, and obviously witnessed it with other people, why, what would you say is the reason why it's so important to talk about it? Um, it's important because we've all had days where we don't want to get out of bed. We don't want to leave the walls of our house. Um, and like not talked about the pain can be like enormous, like inside of ourselves, like that, that pain. And it's not something that we can just get away from because it's always there. Um, I think it's really important to talk about because like, as, as I said before, we all go through it. It's something that everyone goes through and that we deal with on a daily basis. And um, it just, it needs to be talked about. And it should be as, as comfortable and as mainstream as everything else that we talk about, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and like, when you get a scrape on your knee, you go to see a doctor to get it fixed or like, um, for stitches. And when there's something wrong with us or like our minds, we, we don't go to anyone for that because we feel like it's not normal or nobody talks about this. So I should just look. Um, I've noticed there's um, a lot of depression in the communities, a lot of anxiety, a lot of suicidal thoughts, and I've seen a lot of kids that show me scars from harming themselves, and there's just a lot of pain up there that's, that's not talked about or people choose not to see. Some things that I have suggested, and sometimes I even ask you, like, what are some things that you do to kind of get away from the pain or like, you, um, just take a moment and to try and like kind of get grounded and like kind of just think clearly. And I've had a lot of students tell me that being in nature really helps. Um, and like, um, I've also suggested drawing that finding an outlet for, for yourself um, to pour into, to pour like whatever you're feeling into so you're not holding on to it anymore. What are some ways in your life, in your day to day that you handle stress or anxiety? Um, I draw, yeah, I draw a lot. Um, I get that from my dad because my, um, my, my dad is, um, has dealt with substance abuse for pretty much my entire life and um, he's an amazing artist and um, like the, these past couple years he's been sick so he's, he's been trying to find like different ways to um, avoid go, going back to the alcohol and um, so 
he um, he paints every day, um, and he sends me pictures of his paintings, and they're beautiful. And so, I think that that's a great way. Like, um, I've even suggested like singing for one, sports, um, especially like talking to someone to actually like let it out and have someone listen. And, sort of activity. Yeah right, or, or outlet that you enjoy doing, right, that you can, that gets your body mm -hmm. moving, that gets your mind working, and I think it's, yeah. Yeah, like you said, it's important to find something that is going to take your mind off of it a little bit, and, uh, mm -hmm. but something productive. Historical determinants, such as the legacy of residential schools, are believed to have shaped the mental health of Indigenous peoples, and so my question to you is, do you believe that that is still a factor with the youth in the communities today? Yeah, I do. Because um, residential schools had such a huge and painful impact on the Indigenous people. Um, and like the last residential school closed in 1996. That was only 24 years ago. And like that that pain is passed down through generations because in the residential schools you weren't shown love you weren't they were stripped of their culture they were stripped they couldn't speak their language and so going back home to their families it was kind of like they didn't really know who they were anymore and so that's passed down to their children and there's children's children and it's um and i've seen it with um with my family too, um, as well. Yeah, and I think we often think of residential schools as, as historical, right? Or as history, when yeah. in fact it is still very recent history. Um, yeah. Like you said, 1996 being the last school closing and, and lots of people that were there could still be, you know, quite young in their 40s, 50s, um, mm -hmm. And so you're right. I think there would be this generational, um, um, yeah, affecting generations um, afterwards because of the, the things that they were put through. Mm -hmm. And another thing I want to talk about is the suicide rate for Canada for the youth is the third highest in the world. And the rate for Indigenous youth in Canada is three times the national rate. Uh, of the Canadian number. Why do you think that is? That's a hard question. Um, but I also think it's because <clears throat> a lot of the communities are so isolated. And I think it also has to do with like, um, talking about like what's going on inside. A lot of the kids are scared because up in the isolated communities, um, they would get blown out of their of their reserve and flown down to like the nearest city and so that that would be scary for anyone to like um to go away from their family away, away from their home and so it's just it's hard to talk about and a lot of kids are scared to talk about their emotions or like what what they're feeling inside their thoughts and yeah and, it, and it's not as talked about in the communities as well and do you think the access to resources and support um, is, is less in the communities up north? It's very little to none. Okay. Yeah. So that would play a huge role as well. Um, you know, yeah. the resources for speaking to somebody, um, even the resources in the schools up north, I'm sure mm -hmm. is going to be different uh, than in yeah, the cities. Yeah. There was a school that we went to where the guidance counselor was like just a teacher or like a community member. They weren't trained to speak to the children, like um, to help them in that, in, in the way that they need it. And um, counselors or therapists would come up like once every couple months um, for appointments. And so if somebody needs one like the next day and the therapist doesn't come for another month, they have to wait. And so it's just, it's really hard. I would say to hold on, like you're not alone in this. It's like today may feel like 
it's never going to get better. But I promise you, there's going to be one day where you're going to look back on this moment and see how strong you've become. And you just need to remember that because you're going to get past this. Thanks so much to Brittany for connecting and sharing her personal experience. It is so hard to hear that so many schools lack the resources and support systems necessary to deal with mental health. Check out this video on mental health management. Oh my God, I might get emotional. Okay, the biggest thing I wanna tell you is that it's okay to struggle. For anyone who is out there struggling, know that you're not alone. There's other people going through what you're going through too. Being good to yourself. I think sometimes people don't give themselves permission to honor themselves and be good to themselves. What you feel is real and it matters. Right now, you might be feeling like there is no way out, and you might be feeling like your only way out is to end it all. But by doing that, you're robbing yourself from the opportunity to find happiness and to realize how beautiful this life really is. Give yourself a break. Um, take some time off, even if it's just uh, just for you know a day on the weekend or something. Be patient with yourself. We all go through hard times and don't let anyone tell you or discourage you from what you're going through. You know, when I went through what I was going through, I had such a difficult time with my parents because they didn't know how to communicate with me about it and I didn't know how to communicate with them about it. The world is so big now. The internet is there. There, there are resources. You just have to know what the right questions are to ask and, and how, figure out how to find the people that are going through the same things as you. Get off the couch. Just like get off the couch. I know it's so easy to sink into it when you're feeling crummy. Force yourself on a walk. Make sure you're moving your body, whatever that looks like. Dance, yoga, hiking, football, anything. Just move your body. Whatever it takes, go get help. We live in a place where you can get help. If it takes five weeks, three weeks, a month, just wait patiently, don't give up. Don't give up on your life because you will eventually be the person you were before. Trust me on that. I just want you to remember that you can create something from the pain that you're feeling. You can help people. In the midst of all of it, just love yourself. Be patient with yourself. These are things that make you wonderful and unique and uh, develop the personality and develop you into the person you are meant to become and know that you are loved and you're, and you're special and you're wonderful. Every day I'll write down the things that I'm grateful for and when I'm in those dark places, even if I don't believe it, I will just look at that list and say it out loud and remind myself it's going to be okay and you have so much to live for. Be good to yourself, be, forgive yourself, be kind to yourself, you deserve it. It starts with you, and I promise, I promise it'll get better. Find people who care, and if there is no one who does care, stick up for yourself and advocate for yourself, because you're worth it. Things will start to happen, motion will start to happen, and it's never, ever, ever going to be cut and dry, easy, black and white, I'm, I'm anxious, I feel better. Like, it's, it's never going to be that, but at the end of the day, it feels so much better to move forward than to stay stuck. Who can you go to for support? It's so important to find a friend, a family member, or a trusted adult that you can talk to about any issues that you're having with your mental health. If you're fortunate enough to have a counselor in your school, talk to them. They want to hear from you. They want to help you along your journey. I had the opportunity to connect with the counselor at my high school. Check it out. My name is Alice McGregor and I am a high school school, school counselor. Used to be called guidance counselors, now it's called school counselor. Well, I mean, I think that mental health is just as important as physical health. It's, it's, they're intrinsically linked. You can't really talk about one um, without talking about the other, I believe. And, um, and it can be very debilitating to be suffering from a, a mental health um, uh, issue. And uh, I think that it's really important to, um, to keep those conversations open so that people feel free to be able to seek out help. Well, I think sometimes the challenge is that um, it takes a little bit of time 
to, to feel better. It takes time to build a rapport with a student, to build some trust, to sort through all of the symptoms and things that are happening for that person, and then to figure out a little bit of a, 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 way, a way through it and a way to get help um, based on their situation. And I think that that, you know, I tell students that it takes a lot, it takes patience, it's a journey. But I think that that can sometimes be hard because people are often have been suffering for a while. So there's no quick fix, right? And um, so we really do have to take that journey. And when students come and, you know, talk to you and connect with you, what are some ways that, that you tell them that they can cope with, you know, stress and anxiety and depression and things like that? Well, I, I try. Try to look at it, I guess, from a, a holistic point of view. Let's take a look at the different parts of your life. Let's take a look if there's a balance. Let's take a look if you've got some joy in your life. Are you, you know, are you, um, you know, getting out there? Do you have a little difficult with COVID times? But are you um, connecting with people? Are you connecting with nature? Are you doing some physical activity? Are you um, enjoying something that you like to do, whether that's hands-on or reading or some sort of activity that isn't just work or your job or your school. Um, you know, taking a look at all the different parts of, of you and trying to keep them in balance and sometimes really thinking um, seriously about what is not working and what might be a little toxic and how to then deal with that or, you know, eliminate that a little bit from your life. And do you find it sometimes complicated to, you know, get students to understand uh, these things? I, I think it is a bit complicated because um, self-awareness takes time, right? To learning to sort of look at, at everything around you and kind of making some connections. It takes a lot of conversations and it takes a lot of thinking. It's hard work. And I think that some people have been... Um, perhaps struggling with, um, let's say, low-key de depression for a while. They don't remember what it feels like to feel good or to feel better. And when, you're, when your mind isn't organized and when you can't really think through it, it's really hard to sort of figure it out. And certainly it's too hard to figure out alone. So, Yeah, so they need somebody to connect with. Yeah. They need a person to talk it out with and talk it through. I think that the biggest thing is isolation. Uh, I, I, think that, I think that in some cases it's actually been helpful for people to some extent and also a bit harmful, you know, like families that are, that are, that are healthy, um, students are telling me that they're more connected, they're, they're talking more to their parents, to their siblings. It's, um, some of that is, is, is a good thing, but of course, you know, not everyone has the, the good fortune to have, you know, things that are really healthy. So it can also cause a lot of stress. Yeah. So what about kids who, you know, are coming to you and in the school who don't have that family support? What, what well, do you do? Well, I think that it helps if you've got some positive friends and I mean, positive friends who know how to listen. I don't think you can expect your peers at that age to necessarily be able to guide you through to, you know, to, to help you work through something, but they can certainly be part of the journey, right? And um, so I think that that's, that helps. I think that there hopefully is at least one adult that's a trustworthy adult that they can go to. And, um, and hopefully their friends or that adult, if they don't have the background or the knowledge or in mental health, or if they don't know exactly where to get help, that they, they reach out, whether that online or reach out to a counselor or some somebody who can kind of um, uh, guide them or at least get them started. And what what would you say to a young person you know who is maybe embarrassed to come forward and talk to a counselor you know because of the stigma around you know getting help and, and talking to people about their mental health? Well, if, if they actually come in, I, I, I usually tell them that it's very courageous because I, I truly believe that. I think it's a very brave thing to come in and say, I'm struggling to a complete stranger. Um, it's also hard to say that to, a, to someone you love, right? Your family, you, you yeah. just like, what is, you know, what that's, that there's a lot of baggage with that, right? Uh, <clears throat> I would, I really hope that people who have friends who are suffering, that they might say, let me 
let me come along. Let me, I know it's scary to meet with the counselor or it's scary to do this. I'll do it with you. And sometimes that's all that's needed, that little first step, right? And um, I, I have that happen quite often. And uh, I'm, I'm sort of like, it's bravo. Thank you for bringing that person. It's good to meet you. Um, let's start a journey. Yeah, as you say, it's, it's very brave, very courageous. And you have to be very vulnerable and open, you know, when you, when you go out there and talk to somebody and, and are willing to accept help, right? That's a hard thing to do. And it's not very comfortable at first, right? Yeah, for lots of people, especially. And I think, too, in a high school, you know, there's all these other mm -hmm. factors, right? And all these other people. And, you know, you're trying to be a version of yourself and you're trying to, you know, come across a certain way to your peers. And it, it would be hard, I definitely, to, to come out and talk to an adult or a teacher, especially, I know. I would say, I, I would hope that young people wouldn't ignore um, their, their symptoms, that they would, they would pay attention to what's going on in their body and in their minds. I would say there's lots of resources out there. A safe way to start is to go online. There's so much. Um, there's so many organizations, um, Manitoba Health Associations. Um, there's a lot of places to get help. Um, Norwest um, Youth Hub is uh, uh, fairly new in the last couple of years. And it's, uh, it's you know, I, students tell me that they think it's a really great place to go. Um, you're not alone, I would say. If people could just realize that it feels like you're alone, but you're not alone. And you can feel better. I think it's one of the first things I say to people, it's going to take time, but there is a way to feel better. Thanks so much to Mrs. McGregor for sharing the importance of talking with someone, finding help, because you're never alone. Stress. Everyone experiences it both at work and in their personal lives. It's often caused by changes in the world around us that we can't control. But what we can control is how we cope with and react to stress. Let's take a look at some strategies for dealing with it. Make time for hobbies and self-care. When we're stressed, we have a tendency to focus on the things that are stressing us out, and we lose sight of taking care of ourselves. It's important to find some time in your schedule to relax or do what you enjoy. This can give you a renewed sense of energy and well-being. Use time management skills. There may be times where projects and tasks just start to pile up and you feel trapped under it all. This could be due to procrastinating or taking on too much work. Try listing out your tasks and prioritizing them. This can make it easier to get through them and who knows, you may even find some tasks that are unnecessary or that you can delegate to others. Exercise. Stress often makes us tired and increases our anxiety. Studies have shown that over time, exercise can help to reduce anxiety levels and make you feel more energetic. Find an activity that you enjoy, whether it's walking, swimming, or something else, and try fitting it into your schedule a few times a week. Remove unnecessary sources of stress. While you can't control the changes that happen to you, there may be certain stressors that you can eliminate. For example, you could try limiting your access to daily news, spending less time on social media, or reducing the number of new projects you take on. While stress is inevitable, it's important to remember that there are always ways of managing it and improving the quality of your life. Our final guest is a registered psychotherapist who's gonna share her expert opinion on ways that you can cope with stress and anxiety, the importance of finding a counselor, and how we can continue the conversation around mental health. Well, my name is Adrian Moore, and I am a counselor in a post-secondary college in Ontario. So I have a history of working with a lot of teenagers, being in the high school, and working with youth. So. Very cool. Well, thank you for being here today and talking about mental health. Uh, we, we've been talking a lot these last couple of weeks of just the importance of having conversations about it, spreading awareness, and just making it more mainstream and more of a, a topic that everybody can talk about. So thank you for being here. So a psychiatrist is a medical doctor who looks only at medication. Okay. And this might be really helpful for a lot of the youth actually to understand. 
because people go see their psychiatrist thinking that they're going to have a counseling session. Mm -hmm. So your psychiatrist is kind of like seeing your knee specialist. The doctor may be, you know, your family doctor may be good at understanding some of the intricacies of the knee and can do some of it, but it, there may be a limit to that doctor's scope of practice and want to refer you to a knee specialist. Well, the brain and emotions and moods are so complex um, that a psychiatrist is needed. And, and I would like to, you know, destigmatize medication because um, when I first got into the profession, it was like, don't, it was like anti-medication, don't do it, like be strong, fight. And, and maybe it was my youth at the time and, and my hopefulness. Um, but I really do see a place for medication as well as counseling helping. So you have the psychiatrist, as like the medical doctor, and I'm putting it up here like as if it's a hierarchy, but it's, it's not really, although I think the psychiatrist would say this. <laughs> it's, then it's the psychologist who are doing the diagnosing and looking at understanding what is really going on, and they also do counseling, okay? So me as a counselor, I'm not trained to do diagnoses. I can't. I can, you know, identify symptoms, but I'm looking at a behavior and I'm looking at how we really work with um, what's within our control of how we think and our actions. Um, okay, so mental health is, for me, it, it encompasses the whole aspect of a person. So to be mentally healthy means someone who can maintain their normal functioning of life, being able to cope with the normal stresses, go to work and be productive, contribute to their community. Um, but it's also that, uh, that social connection, um, the spiritual connection. So that wellness is in, like, it's, it's um, so huge on so many levels. Well, I think there's a bit of a tendency to not understand feelings and emotions, that it is really normal to feel feelings of depression, to feel sad, to feel blue, uh, to feel anxious and nervous, and, and feel them intensely and know that that's normal. That's mm -hmm. part of the landscape of what it means to be human. Um, and I think we've we're so busy trying to gloss it over and make nice for everything, for everyone that we haven't talked about, you know, the real messiness of life and to be able to understand when um, general challenges are bordering into illness. And so instead of it's either everything's all good and we're normal, but if it's not good, we're not normal. Right. You know? And just, I think it's important that we, Begin to talk about what it's really like. Well, some of the signs we we look at things as frequency, intensity, and duration. Mm -hmm. How frequent is it that you're feeling high anxiety, stress, tension, um, unsettled, or depressed? You know, and how intense is it on one to ten? And how long are these episodes lasting? So that helps kind of look at things just a little bit more. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, when we've gone through a job loss, uh, which is pretty common right now, or loss of opportunities of not being able to do what we wanted to do with this pandemic, um, we can have some real feelings of grief and loss. And, and there, there is a normal period of time of working through that grief. Mm -hmm. um, if we're telling people to hurry up and get through it, and they're, you know, we're not actually really feeling it, acknowledging it and move through it, um, then maybe we need to take a look at it. But everyone's timing through it is different um, because somebody's loss about not getting to move into residence first year may be significantly more devastating and impactful than it is for somebody else. So you can't you can't compare those two situations mm -hmm. for 
for each person. There's gonna, there could be a different reaction, part of it's normal. It's how long for the duration that it continues that you need to check into. So, you know, there is a bit of work involved. And when you're feeling really low, um, maybe depression and you don't want to get out of bed, that's the one thing you actually really do need to do. Um, it, it does require work. And um, so I would say the three main important things are get regular sleep, like go to bed at the same time, wake up at the same time, whatever that looks like. Because I know youth, they like to stay out later and you know, there's attraction to being up late and then sleeping through most of the day. But, and, and a lot of my students I work with, they roll their eyes, like I'm so old, like, come on, Adrian. But really, ideally from a natural circadian rhythm, it's go to bed at 11, wake up around seven or eight, which doesn't fit with a lot of youth. But so try and fit in some sleep there. Eating healthy, um, watching your carbs and having a lot of like sugar and caffeine, that different rush of um, chemicals can really kind of wreak some havoc on, on what's happening in the brain. So trying to minimize some of that um, movement. So for like, I would say, I mean, 40 years, maybe not quite that long, but just about, I hated the word exercise, <laughs> but it is so important. So I would say find movement, however that looks like, you know, like dancing's hard work and for some people, but it's, it's a natural way of moving, right? And, and enjoying the body and appreciating. Like when my kids brought home a hamster and I saw it running on the wheel, it was like, oh yeah, everything needs to move. Even this little tiny hamster needs to run and, and burn off yeah. steam, right? Yeah, and like you said, it, it's gonna be, it might be a different form of movement for every person. Yeah. Yeah, so it doesn't have to be going to the gym or working out or going for a run. You want to go out for a walk. Um, you, if you like jumping rope for some reason, you know, um, even shoveling, chopping wood, doing, you know, some more strenuous stuff. Um, you know, yeah. If you're really scrubbing at some dishes, <laughs> you can <laughs> get your body moving. Yeah, in That's some way. That's right. Yeah, be creative. And I think what you said too about you know the sleep and the the diet i think is is consistency right it's going to be something that like you said going to bed at the same time getting up you know having that healthy diet not introducing things into your body that are going to spike you know your adrenaline or your energy or whatever like the caffeine the sugar those things that are going to be inconsistent in your yeah. in your body yeah very cool I think with the the effect has has been pretty significant on on youth um, with their socializing and keeping in contact with people and having that face to face and and seeing the facial expressions around conversations. Um, I think that's been hard that that isolation, that physical touch, like you know, a pat on the back, a high five, whatever, you know, fist bump, just even that is something, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, and there's decreased movements, you know, things, people thinking, well, oh, I would, I would love to join a certain class, but, you know, can I? Maybe that's only for um, sort of, yeah, buts with this pandemic and the, and excuses. Um, and excuses, and I don't mean that as a negative. Um, but I think there has also been some positive things that have come out of the pandemic. Um, in that uh, I saw more people outside uh, on my street than I, I mean, I've only lived in this house for about three years. And until then, I wouldn't say that I saw anybody walking down my street, <laughs> whereas now, it's really busy now. Right. People are also really starting to be mindful and reflective of um, what path they're on, you know, what program they're studying, what job they're doing, um, you know, who means the most to them that they're going to bubble with for a bit and, you know, what they really want to spend their money on. So I think it's 
getting us to be more mindful and a little bit more present. And I'm hoping since, because we're all going through it, we're feeling a little bit more connected and less disconnected. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a really tough question, Tyler. And um, that's been a, Canada has been a high number for youth suicide since 20 years ago when I first started working with youth and suicide. Um, and, you know, I've, I've wondered, is it, you know, that we're bored? Is it that, you know, I don't know, we, we haven't had as a culture to go and gone through major catastrophic events. And, and that seems so dismissive in, in many ways. Um, what I really think is what's gone on for a lot of people around the world is, and not just in Canada, is um, a feeling of disconnection. I mean, the, one of the common um, symptoms that can lead people to contemplate suicide is a feeling of helplessness, a feeling of hopelessness, mm -hmm. um, and feeling really lonely. I mean, we don't talk about, we don't give sh examples of how to deal with loneliness. So, it's, you know, the kids at the, at the um, burger joint with a big giant milkshake or the guy at the bar drinking, like, it's always about stuffing it down. We don't show what it means to deal with loneliness. Mm -hmm. so, it's hard. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's, it was just interesting to me learning you know, more about this topic and doing some research. And, and that was one of the things that kind of kept coming up when you look at mental health in Canada um, is the suicide rate and just, and how high it is. Um, and then increasingly high among Indigenous youth, of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That was something that I had the opportunity to talk to Brittany about. And yeah, it, she kind of had the same response that it's almost, there's not one reason why um, it's so many factors that, that, um, that, you know, would bring that to be the highest, the rate being so high in Canada. There's so many different things that, that contribute to that. Um, and it is, it's a complex issue, I think in Canada. And I think people are, we're dealing with it more now than ever. Um, but yeah, it's still an issue for sure. Mm, it is. And you know what? It is so helpful. Um, I explained to people that going to see a counselor is like having a mirror put up. I mean, I couldn't tell you right now if I have mustard on my nose from dinner tonight or something on my chin, right? But you're an outsider. You could see it. Um, and sometimes family and friends are concerned about what they may say to you or how they might point things out to you and, and what might happen. Um, I'm an objective person and I'm skilled and trained that I'm going to be able to say something that maybe your family and friends are afraid to say to you in a really nice way <laughs> to help you maybe understand because we are so busy. There's so much that we see about what we're doing from here up that we don't necessarily what's happening here down. And, um, and that's, as a counselor, that's kind of my job is to help you see what you're doing that may be self-sabotaging or something, a, a barrier that, you know, maybe we can get through. But in terms of tips, my favorite by all means is self-compassion. Um, Chris Neff um, and Chris Germer are huge at promoting it. And I would say that the biggest takeaways are really paying attention to the tone of voice that you use when you talk to yourself and the words that you use when you talk to yourself. Mm -hmm. So paying attention to that inner dialogue that's going on in your head and asking yourself like, whoa, would I ever say this to another person? And would I ever use that tone of voice? Right. You know, and really working to like bring that down to much more pleasant, supportive, patient kind of way of talking to yourself. Still matter of fact, still honest, but just 
a slight twist in compassion and, and understanding. We have learned so much in the last two weeks, and we have heard so many amazing and different perspectives and opinions on mental health and what that means. We've learned that our mental health is just as important as our physical health. We talked about ways that you can cope with stress, anxiety, depression, isolation, and so many other things in your day-to-day -day life. And we discussed the importance of talking about it. My goal these last two weeks was to break the stigma around mental health, that it's okay to have conversations, that it's okay to open up, that it's okay to tell everyone how you're feeling. I hope that you got something out of these videos. I hope that you learned a little bit more about mental health and that you will continue the conversation if you have any questions or comments about mental health or these last two videos, please send me a message or a comment below. If you haven't already, click the subscribe button and hit the bell icon so that you get notifications every time we post a new video. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great week.